important, most important, my uh, my associate, my wonderful intern, who will be assisting me in this uh, program, uh, Sister Greta, who I want to give opportunity right now just to introduce herself, where she's at, and 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 where she's from, and what she's studying. Greta, please. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Greta Garcia Jalil Melendez. I am an intern with Islamic Village USA in the Department of Public Affairs Research and Advocacy. I am a rising senior at the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts Amherst, studying political science with a minor in Arabic. And my interests include um, refugee policy. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Greta. Uh, and so Greta is going to be assisting me primarily in scanning um, the questions that you submit. Yes, this is going to be interactive. We are using Zoom conference, so we cannot see you directly, or our panelists can't see you directly, but there is a question uh, function that should be at the bottom of your screen. So as you're listening to our various panelists and they're raising issues, if you have questions, please, again, there's no, there's no dumb questions. All questions are great. If you're thinking of it, odds are someone else is thinking of it, that type of question, get it on there put it into the box. Greta will be screening those. She'll be looking to see if there's similarity, similarities between questions and synthesizing them and putting them to our, uh, our panelists. And also, if you have a question specific for a particular panelist, panelist of a particular organization, please state that in your question if you're directing it to a particular speaker or if it's just a general question for everyone. So, um, so yes, there'll be questions. Also, we have six speakers today, six organizations represented. We don't want to have a long 40 minutes of just presentations, which kind of I know tires you out, gets your eyes rolling back, glazed over. So what we're going to do is we're going to take two segments. We're going to start off with three speakers who will each speak for five minutes, giving you a little bit about their organization, the purpose of the organization, specifically the different types of programs that they provide to students and uh, young professionals, their internships and fellowships, or maybe just one of the two. Um, share also some uh, important details about what are some of the privileges or benefits if you are accepted into the program. And then also, also, also important, I know many of you want to know, well, what are the dates, the application dates? We have to submit, submit an application. When are they coming? Uh, when I need to start preparing for them. And then also, uh, what are some of the tips on what makes a strong candidate in their application? Um, and then also maybe some highlights of if they, how they benefit the program if they went through it or, um, or some of the you know, features of you know, some, what other previous internships or fellows have gone on with their uh, program. So we'll start off with three, then we'll take off a, a brief break for five to eight minutes and take maybe two or three questions, immediate questions for those three groups and representatives. And then we'll start up the last cohort of three more speakers. At the end for the last 25 minutes, we will have all six speakers available uh, to answer your questions. So keep those questions rolling in. All right. So again, we thank you for joining this webinar. We want to help inform you, provide you with the resources, you know, if you are interested in potentially interning in, in, in Congress in Capitol Hill. And, and I know for many of you, especially during this time where many of us and many of our you know families are facing uh, economic hardship, you know, the recession, um, or also for many people, the idea of, you know, having an internship is, well, how do I afford that? You know, how, if I'm in DC, where do I get housing? How do I pay for that? Where am I, gonna, if I'm paying for housing, where am I have money for food? And so these are important questions that are, many people share. And that's the great thing about the organizations we, we have brought to this organization will also help cover that um, and some of the resources that they uh, provide you. So we're going to get started right now with the first uh, three organizations. Well, let me quickly just let you know, the six organizations represented today are APACS, or the Asian Pacific American Congressional uh, uh, Center. Second is also the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And then we also the Congress Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, along with Islamic Scholarship Fund uh, and the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center, and last but not least, uh, the Washington, Washington, the I'm sorry, the Women's Congressional Policy Institute (WCPI). You'll get all these names. You'll get also links. Greta will be for each speaker. On each speaker, get your chat box open. As with each speaker, Greta will be putting in uh, links for you to use to copy to each institution, 
and to particularly their web pages for their fellowships and or their uh, internships and fellowships. All right, so today we're gonna to start off with our first speaker uh, who's been joining us, I think these three or four years now, this is our sixth year hosting this, this event or I would greatly appreciate his, uh, his participation, but Dennis Gonzalez is the uh, Senior Director for Leadership Programs at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute here, here in Washington, DC. Brother Dennis, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Jihad. So th thank you all for, for having us. So the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, um, really quickly, is an organization that was started in 1978 uh, to help diversify uh, Washington, D.C. and provide more opportunities uh, for Hispanic or Latino or Latinx uh, young leaders to get experience on Capitol Hill. Um, our organization started with a fellowship program for recent college grads, but now has grown to four different programs, which is our high school program, our congressional internship program, which is specifically for undergraduate students and recent college grads, our public policy fellowship, uh, which is for um, recent college grads within the last three years of the, finishing their degree, and then our graduate program, which is for recent uh, folks who have recently gotten an advanced degree within the past two years. So I'm going to briefly talk a little bit more about each program um, so that you all kind of have a sense of what our interns do. So if you want to move to the next slide, uh, our Congressional Internship Program, uh, we run our cycle currently three times a year. Uh, it's fall and spring, or it's a 12-week program, and our summer program is a 10-week program. So it's a little bit shorter. And for folks to know, during the academic year, we normally have more seniors uh, fifth year students, uh, where our summer program tends to be a lot more sophomores, people going into their second year of college. Um, so if depending on your experience and what you're trying to kind of connect with in terms of a community, it, those are kind of the big differences in that besides the timing. Um, our internship is a full time program. Uh, our program, uh, our program participants work a minimum of 40 hours a week. Uh, 32 hours a week or four days a week is a congressional office placement, either House, Senate, or in a committee. These are some of the job responsibilities that each intern does when they're working in their offices. Um, one day a week, we offer professional development programming. So we cover a congressional simulation. Uh, we do networking sessions. Uh, we bring in lobbyists to talk about funding and government. Uh, we also do financial literacy. Uh, we also do trips to the State Department and to embassies for folks who want to go into international development. So we try to make it a holistic experience, uh, start the start to end for folks who may want to work on the Hill or just want to work in Washington, D.C. in general. So we really try to focus our programming for professional development for folks, even those who don't want to ever come back to Washington, D.C., which is OK, that at least that's the point of an internship it's for you to learn that you want to be part of that community or you don't want to be part of that work community or work field. Um, so we're really open to having some of those honest conversations with our intern classes. Uh, some of the program benefits for the internship specifically, we um, pay our interns about 625 every two weeks uh, gross. So that's about 3750 uh, for the fall and spring semesters and about 3125 during the summer. And though that does not sound like a lot of money, however, uh, we also provide a domestic round trip flight or train to Washington, DC. So we cover the cost of getting to DC and getting home. Also, um, shuttling you to and from the airport to CCI housing and CCI housing is a uh, fully included. So we provide uh, rent, utility, and internet. So there are no costs or fees in terms of housing that you all need. You basically just need to bring food and things that you need for your toiletries, et cetera. But we cover all of, it's a fully furnished housing. Um, we also provide our interns a monthly metro stipend um, for each month that they are here. And we also provide uh, health care coverage uh, during the experience in DC because we know that some interns, their internship health care only covers them at home or in the, where their university is. So we make sure that you're covered while you're in DC. Um, our graduate programs, our public policy and our graduate fellowships are a little bit different. They are a nine month experience. So they start in the fall. Um, and they go all the way through May. So currently our fellows that are coming in are from this August, and then they'll go all the way through May of 2023. Uh, our fellows have two placements. Um, 
one is in a congressional office and then their secondary placement tends to be at an agency a nonprofit, a think tank so they can get both experiences on the hill and off the hill in washington um, they also work four days a week and our fellows also get professional development training on fridays but their professional development's a little bit different because they're a little bit more experienced or a little bit older um, so choosing the right job how to negotiate benefits and salary community organizing media training as being a spokesperson for public speaking so they have the different types of training that our interns do um, but it's generally the same setup um, for benefits. And I put a little asterisk there for stipends. Um, currently with this current pass group, they were $2,900 a month for public policy fellows and $3,300 a month for gross pay for graduate fellows. But this was this previous group's um, numbers. Those should go up. I can't uh, uh, totally tell you the, what the number is going to be, but we also make accommodations for uh, pay on the Hill and what's going on in current and temporary. So by next year, 2023, um, that may probably go up. And we also provide uh, round trip airfare, Metro benefit, housing and professional development funding for our fellows. Um, all of our programs are going to, our applications are going to open September 15th. So uh, for their 2023 cycles, we'll start uh, in September. They will launch with our conference this year, hopefully. Um, so uh, we'll be launching at the end of mid to late September uh, for all of our programs, including our fellowship and our internship programs. Happy to chat with folks uh, closer to the end. Thank you so much, Dennis, and for sharing all those uh, great details, particularly for both the internships and fellowship programs. Um, and also a lot of information there. So again, we're having questions. You can present questions uh, to clarify any comments made. Second, Greta's putting the links in there. She's going to uh, put the links line by line next, a little bit more to make it easier for you to cut and paste going forward. And then also, uh, we got a great question from Sharonda Adams. Uh, yes, this program right now is going live on YouTube but we will also place the recording of it. Uh, I think it should go live tomorrow morning or so. It takes about you know a couple of hours for us to get it updated, uh, uploaded to YouTube at Islam or Khalif's uh, website uh, on YouTube. So if you miss something here, you can always go back. Or also really important, please share with friends who may be interested in this type of information about these opportunities. Uh, so if you miss anything, uh, you can still see the recording. And the last thing, uh, we'll also there is the uh, points of contact the contact information we'll be sharing with you uh, for all our speakers if you want to follow up with a respective institution and director for their programs. All right. Next up, we have Nicholas uh, Kishava, who is the uh, program associate for the Asian Pacific American Congressional for Congressional Studies, or APAX, here in Washington, D.C. Nicholas, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me and uh, thank you everybody for joining. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about my organization. Um, like you said, I'm Nicholas Kishab. I'm a programs associate here at the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies, uh, APAX for short. It's a little bit shorter than that whole long thing. Um, a little bit about our organization. We were founded in 1994 by uh, late Secretary Norman Neda in tandem with the Congressional Asian Pacific American Cau Caucus, uh, KPAC. Uh, and really our organizational goal is about promoting and building the pipeline of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, um, AH and HPIs, uh, really promoting the pipeline for them to get into elected office and public service. Uh, we do that through, you know, primarily through our various programs, uh, such as academies that teach A and HPIs how to run for office. And of course our flagship congressional internship and fellowship programs. Uh, so, First, I'll go ahead and dive into our internship program. This is similar to CHCI. We do offer this year round. So we have a summer, fall and spring cohort um, in terms of kind of like what environment you're looking for between the three. Uh, our summer tends to be a bit larger. Uh, we're of the three tri caucuses. We are definitely the smallest as we're the youngest, but our summer internship tends to be about 15 to 20 students, whereas our fall and spring tends to be anywhere from five to 10. Um, our summer also tends to be a little bit on the younger side, um, kind of sophomore and juniors. However, when it comes to our internship, we do kind of look for leaders in the AA and HPI community. Uh, students have been really active in their AA and HPI organizations on campus, um, as well as having a good political background. Um, our application process includes a resume cover letter, essay responses, and a letter of recommendation. Uh, and then selected candidates are placed in various personal offices, committees, and agencies. Um, 
For example, currently we have one student on the uh, House Natural Resources Committee, while we also have a student at the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Um, and then when it comes to kind of more specific details, um, summer internship is definitely the most popular. So we end the application cycle a little bit early. Um, you have to apply at the beginning of the year. We close our application in January, uh, and then we review candidates for the following three months. Uh, fall application, if anybody's watching and is interested, it's actually open until this Friday. Uh, and then we'll be reviewing candidates for the next month and a half, and we'll be placing candidates for uh, September through November. And then our spring application opens uh, early, uh, early fall and then closes around December. Uh, placements occur, the internship starts and goes from January to uh, April. And then when it comes to benefits, uh, APAX is a paid opportunity. We offer a monthly stipend of $1,275. Uh, we also provide housing, round trip airfare to, the, to Washington DC, as well as Metro. Um, so really APAX is best to cover all of the extraneous costs needed to attend. Um, we really prioritize kind of breaking down barriers, especially with uh, kind of how broad the AA and HPI is. So if, um, you know, we take candidates all the way from Guam to kind of Midwest and then common areas where a lot of Asian Americans are, such as California and New York. Um, next, I'll talk about our fellowship program. Uh, this is our nine month paid program with a monthly stipend of $3,200. Uh, it goes from September through May. Uh, the application for this is similar, includes resume, cover letter, essay responses, two letters of recommendation, and all transcripts. Uh, this is one of our more rigorous programs to apply to. We typically have upwards of 200 plus applications for somewhere between 10 and 15 fellowship spots. Uh, the expectation for our fellows is that they're by the middle or end of their fellowship, they're capable of performing um, at a junior legislative assistant level. So it's, it's definitely a rigorous opportunity. Um, and so we really prioritize candidates who are capable of entering this program and then using it as a launch pad to kind of further career and just haven't had the opportunity to get their foot in the door um, at a mid-level on Capitol Hill. Um, as part of this program, we do offer numerous professional development opportunities as well as access to the APAX alumni network. Um, we understand that not everybody is gonna enjoy their time on Capitol Hill. And so we do our best to um, expose our fellows to different opportunities such as lobbying, private industry, um, nonprofit work. Um, and for this program, we actually already finished our application cycle for the year we're currently placing, uh, given that our fellows start in September. Uh, and we typically open the application for this in mid to late fall and end it early spring, late winter. Um, and so kind of the best way to keep up to dates or keep up to date with our applications is by, you know, keeping up on our website and our social media and subscribing to our newsletter. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of everything, a little bit of a rundown on our, uh, on our different programs. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you, Nicholas. And again, thank you, Greta, for sharing those links. And, and she's also put in uh, the email address. Uh, if you do have questions further for Nicholas, uh, if you're not able to get our specific question asked during this program. So, and also I do see some questions rolling in. Again, please use the question function. I, I've seen maybe one or two questions have been put into the chat. Uh, we're glad those questions come in, but there's a lot of information being put into the chat line, a lot of those links. So tr please try to put your questions into the Q&A function so we make sure we don't miss it uh, as the chat line is moving quickly with uh, information. All right, next up, uh, joining us uh, from the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, would be Brother Devry Manier, a uh, program manager uh, with CBCF. And we want to thank again, along with uh, particularly uh, CHCI and APEX, they've been doing this uh, program with us for uh, six years. So we always value having the CBCF on. Brother uh, Devry, the floor is yours. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, like everyone said, my name is Devry Manier. I am the program manager for the Leadership Institute with the Congressional, my bad Jihad said, I am the um, program manager for the Leadership Institute with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And I'm gonna tell you briefly about what the organization does and um, in regards to our fellowships, our scholarships, our internships, and also um, our alumni conversation that we have with our um, interns and our fellows. 
So just a brief overview of the CBCF's mission. Our mission is simply um, to advance the global Black community by developing leaders and forming policy and educating the public. We are a space where we envision the world uh, where all communities have an equal voice in public policy uh, through leadership cultivation, economic empowerment, and civic engagement. All right, so that is pretty much our overview of everything that we do. I'm not going to go into all of our history, but this is just the information for you all. Um, our history, we were established in 1976 by CBC members, which is the Congressional Black Caucus, um, and we began as a nonpartisan research institute. Uh, we now are an American educational foundation, and we conduct research on issues affecting African Americans. We publish a yearly report on our key legislation and sponsor issue forums, leadership seminars, and scholarships. So that is like a brief overview. You can go to the next slide. All right, in regards to the Leadership Institute, we were created um, as the Legislative Internship Program. We now run as the Leadership Institute to address the underrepresentation of Black professional staff on Capitol Hill. The CBCF is split into two programs. We have our summer um, program that we actually have right now, and we also have our fall and spring program that we have, and we also have our Congressional Fellows program that is a nine-month nine program for graduate students and young professionals. All right, you can go to the next slide. Like I said, it's our internships, our fellowships, and our alumni conversation and scholarships. All right, in regards to our internships, we, like everyone, like the Tri Caucus has said, um, CACI and APEX, we have a fall and spring internship. We also have a summer internship program. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of what those internships look like in those um, different semesters. All right, in regards to our summer, we um, approximately bring in 60 congressional interns total. We place our interns in CBC offices during our summer. Um, the difference with our spring and fall and summer is that in our fall and spring, we don't necessarily place interns only in Congressional Black Caucus offices. So interns are um, able to be placed in various congressional offices. But in our summer, we specifically place interns in our um, congressional um, members' offices and things of that nature. We do also have a program that is our C-suite, which is called our Pathways to um, our Corporate um, Spaces. So that is an opportunity for interns to have that experience in a corporate space as well. So in our summer, we bring in 60 congressional interns. Um, in our sub, uh, summer, we also have um, for a, le a lesser amount of our C-suite. So we currently have two interns that are C-suite. In our fall and spring, we brought in, we bring in around 24 congressional interns and um, in our C-suite, we can bring up to uh, 13 of those interns. Um, another information, another um, key information about these internships is our requirements fluctuate um, depending on our fall and spring and our summer. So our summer, we do take in um, interns that are rising sophomores up to recent grads. And in our fall and spring, we do bring um, in interns that are uh, rising seniors um, and recent grads. So we do, uh, when you are looking for um, our applications or uh, looking to apply for one of our programs, please be uh, mindful of what that, um, what those requirements are for that, those programs. All right, for our congressional internships, um, we have our fall, in our fall and spring, we have something called our State Farm Congressional Interns and our Walmart Congressional Interns. So when you are placed in a State Farm Congressional Internship, you will be learning more about press and media relations, and you will ideally be placed with a secretary, a press secretary, or a communications director. And if you are with our Walmart Congressional Emerging Leaders, you will be more so in a policy making and a legislative process type of space, and you'll typically be reporting to an intern coordinator. So those are the two um, specific uh, placements you'll be within our fall and spring. All right, the core components of our internship program, we do run in a cohort model uh, focused on whole person development like CHCI and APEX. We do want to make holistic interns. So we don't want you all just to be uh, professionals. We also uh, um, work on your professional development. We also wanna work on your personal development. We do um, whole prof weekly professional development. We do match our ment um, interns with mentors um, throughout the program that are our alumni. And we do have a pretty large um, alumni um, council or panel. We have over 8,000 members in our program. We do have a smart goal creation um, um, 
opportunity for our interns where they um, create, come up with smart goals that are tangible in their office. Um, we do work on a bill drafting project with our interns in the fall and spring, and then our interns do participate in a mock Congress presentation in our summer, and we do um, do weekly journals and surveys to get our interns feedback throughout the program. So just a little bit about the overview of our internship for our fall, since our summer is currently happening. Um, the program will take place um, from August 19th to December uh, 9th. That is a 16 uh, week program and in our fall, sorry, our summer programs are nine weeks and our fall and spring are 16 week programs. Um, interns will be provided housing. We do provide them with a $4,000 stipend uh, paid bi-weekly. We also do place um, office in various congressional offices, committees, subcommittees, and federal agencies. Um, everything is provided for the interns in our program. Um, I know in the past we have uh, worked with uh, pro providing airfare um, for our interns to and fro, um, but that is something that we also are working to bring back into our space. So that is something that uh, we do provide. So once you are you are uh, you do get here, you um, are already. Um, already have housing, we do pay for your stipend. We also do give you a Metro card and things of that nature. Um, when you are applying for our program, you just have to have a minimum 2.5 requirement on a 4.0 scale. Um, you should be at least a college senior by the program start date and have a permit to work in the US and demonstrate interest in public policy, uh, governance and uh, policy making um, processes. Sorry, something popped up on the screen. Uh, week, yep. So this is all information that's on our uh, website. I'm not going to go uh, in depth with this one, but this is just our requirements for our fall internship program. Like I said, 16 week program, we provide our interns um, um, on Capitol Hill and we do provide weekly, uh, we recommend weekly COVID testing required in a $4,000 stipend with an additional $150 Metro card um, that is provided to our interns. Now going into our fellowship, we do have three different programs for our fellows. We have our Congressional Fellowship, our NREI Social Justice Fellows, and our Research Fellows. And with that, our in our um, overview of our uh, fellowship program, this is a graduate level um, opportunity for professionals. Um, a graduate level professionals, this is a one year program. We are sponsored by various corporations. Our congressional fellows complete a six month rotation on Capitol Hill with a CBC member, and then they complete a six month rotation on a committee or subcommittee in alignment with their areas of expertise. And our NREI, uh, John R. Lewis uh, Social Justice Fellows, they complete a six month rotation, and then in their space after their First six months, they go into another rotation of a six month program and they'll be conducting research on behalf of the CBCF with, um, with the Center for uh, po Public Policy, sorry, Policy Analysis and Research. And um, I can't read the rest for our uh, research fellows, but um, that information is on our website as well. And the core components for our fellowship program are we do run in a cohort model in that space as well. Uh, monthly professional development, a social impact service project that is in partnership with nonprofit organizations, a public, um, I'm gonna say a policy brief creation and presentations, smart goal uh, creation, and a monthly reflections and journal surveys as well for our fellowship program. And these are the programs that we, um, our scholarship programs that we have for um, individuals that are interested in these. I'm not gonna just go into all of them, but these are just in a few of them. And like I said, all of this information is on our uh, website. Um, and you also are gonna get all that information in the chat as well. And if you all have any questions, you all can reach out to um, internships at cbcfinc.org. Another, um, another key component is our, um, Fall internship program is closing uh, July. Uh, applications are closing July 1st. So please get on that if you are interested in our internship for the fall. And if you are in, uh, interested in our fellowship um, program that is happening in the fall, um, please go to our website to um, stay up to date with all that information. And uh, of course, follow us on all of our social medias. And that is all that I have for now. All right. Thank you, Brother Devery. And, Thank you. and I want to. Dennis, Devery, and Nicholas um, from uh, CBCF, CHCI, and APEX. If you come to DC, you're just gonna get used to learning acronyms. Uh, word of advice to everyone, but take your time. Always ask what they mean, uh, but DC is letter soup city. Um, uh, but I, I wanna thank, and also collectively, the three uh, foundations and institutes are also known on the Capitol as the Tribe Caucus. And, uh, and I know from my time on Capitol, when I worked in Congress and seeing me the interns, uh, one of the benefits is I know that all three of your organizations also work together to do joint activities 
for all your interns together, the congressional black, Hispanic, and uh, Asian uh, students, graduate students who are in these programs, get to go to receptions, uh, outings, and so much of this professional network amongst your own peers. So that's a great benefit uh, of, of one of the, these various programs. All right. Um, so we're going to go into some a couple of questions. We're going to take about five minutes or so to take one or two questions um, before we transition to our next cohort of three speakers. Uh, so Greta, is there a question you want to uh, start off uh, that you want to share? And please let us know if it's to particularly uh, a particular panelist. Uh, yes. Um, for the first question, um, this is from Terry Lane. Um, hello, I am. I graduated from undergrad in 2016. I am interested in the fellowship program. Am I still eligible for this opportunity? Um, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of the CBCF. Yes, you are eligible. Um, as long as you are working on your master's program, um, working on um, your graduate degree. Yeah, I can answer for APACs. Um, our, our program is really aimed at young professionals um, who do have a little bit of working experience. And so, um, you know, if anything, having graduated four to six years ago is kind of what we're looking for, people who are really prepared to go in and, and do really good work on Capitol Hill and represent our community. Um, for CHCI, um, so for ours, for the Public Policy Fellowship, you have to have graduated from an undergraduate degree within three years. And for the Graduate Fellowship, it's two years. So for 2023 uh, cycles, you have had to have gotten a master's degree, either just finishing 2020 class of 2022 or class of 2021. And so for um, the Public Policy Fellowship, it's class of 2020 through 2023. Thank you for all sharing your response to that question. I have a question uh, for, for these first three organizations. Uh, they are uh, uh, organizations, institutions uh, representing uh, the and benefiting uh, racial, ethnic uh, identities and communities, uh, congressional black and Hispanic and Asian and Pacific American. Um, in America, racial identity, I think it can be very fluid. So I know I can understand questions could be, uh, for example, um, say, you know, historically there's a large population um, in, uh, in Southern Mexico, you know, from uh, the Yucatan in the state of Guerrero, Afro-Mexican populations, they migrate to America, or say Puerto Rican communities, or various communities that have mixed hybrid identities. So with someone like that, uh, who's definitely of a cultural background, being Mexican or Mexican-American or Chicano, but also of having African heritage, do they apply to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation? Or do they can apply to the Con Congressional Hispanic Institute if they have these various identities? And also for APEX, um, you know, historically, the United States, when People can think about the historical trajectory of Asian communities is, is highly focused on uh, Eastern Asian communities, Chinese, Korean, Japanese. But say people coming from Europe historically, Asian is usually uh, considered for communities from South Asia, Pakistan, India, and so forth. Um, and also Asia is a huge continent. What if you're from Iraq? I don't know. Uh, so what is that? How, how do we define Asian, particularly the Asian Pacific American and, and who the, the diversity? Anybody want to take the first step at maybe this, the complexity of American racial identity and what best aligns for your, your applicants. Sure, I can, I can pop in really quick. I know for CHCI, um, we allow people to self-identify. So whatever you identify is, if you're, if you identify Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, that, that works for us. Um, we have actually had, um, historically, it doesn't happen a lot, but we have had people who did both a, a CHCI and CBCF. So there, there is some intersectional experiences for folks um, that have worked on that. And in, with Latinos or Hispanics, um, a lot are intermixed with a lot of things. So we do have a lot of Asian American Latinos, Black Latinos, like Latinos that are of all kinds and all shapes and colors. So we, we accept folks who self-identify as Latino. We don't, we're not here to tell people what they are, we're not. <laughs> so um, we're happy to include folks who wanna be included into part of the circle. Yeah, just to with Dennis, definitely just to reiterate, we don't we so um, we allow the interns to self identify. We do have interns that are Afro Latino um, and things of that nature, Black and um, Asian descent and things of that nature. We do try once if they do select our program, we do also 
refer them to resource, um, provide them other resources to other uh, caucuses as well. So if they wanted to connect or mingle with individuals um, that are like-minded like themselves as well, we do provide them with those spaces. So it's not like once you are in our program, you do not have resources to the other programs that are around, you are able to um, interact and mingle as such because definitely intersectionality is something that is in our communities as minorities is I'm not just this, I'm not just that. I want to be able to um, merge both of my identities. Um, and as a tri caucus, we do meet we uh, we do meet often, so we do have our interns um, connect in that space, so that it's not that we are um, not working together to um, have that intersection uh, intersectionality at the forefront. Yeah, similarly similarly with Apex, we we allow students and applicants to self identify. Um, as you said, it is very much like East Asian focused when it comes to Asian Americans. So we really prioritize South, A uh, South Asians, Southeast Asians, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians. Um, and we do include also Middle East learners if they choose to apply. Uh, again, we, we allow people to self-identify with the A and HBI community. All three of you, thank you again for making those clarifications. I'm sure that information will come in really handy, and useful for our, our, our participants. And again, for all you participants out there, I uh, hope this is already benefiting you. And also remember, even if you're interning in DC or if you're not with this information, you are now ambassadors of all this great information. You utilize it, but also share with your friends at your college, universities, your youth groups uh, that may benefit from these particular uh, identity-based uh, organizations that help increase the pipeline of diverse students for, uh, for internships and fellowships on Capitol Hill. All right, so we're going to move on now to our next cohort of three speakers. Uh, again, Nicholas and Dennis and uh, Debbie will still be around when we do uh, get to the final 20 minutes of Q&A. So don't feel like you missed the opportunity to give them a question, but we're going to move on now to our next speaker. So next up, uh, we have uh, representing, uh, oops, sorry, lost my, there it is, Sister Vimala Fongsavan, who is a organizing director for the Congressional Progressive Cent uh, Caucus Center. And, and again, we, we're happy to have Amala on. She spoke many years ago when she worked at APEX, and now she's at CPCC, and we're happy to have her back on. Sister Pamala, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Jihad, and, and always uh, love being here. And um, I, I never thought I'd become like a, a fellowship expert in DC, but, but here we are. Uh, so as uh, Jihad mentioned, um, my name is Vamala Pongswan. Uh, she, her pronouns, I'm calling in from the stolen Nipmunk and Wapanag lands uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, I'm the organizing director at the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center or the CPCC. Um, and I get to do the awesome work of bringing together community leaders, organizers, advocates, uh, unions, pol and policy experts um, to build a more just, equitable and resilient nation. Uh, and the CPCC is an infrastructure building organization, meaning we bring together um, people in multiple ways. We have our movement table, which aims to promote cross-movement solidarity uh, among the, the progressive movement. Uh, we have a labor council that brings together unions and trade organizations, um, a policy and research council that brings together think tanks and economists. Um, and we also have a legislative team made up of a lot of former Hill staffers uh, that provide timely and legislative analysis and explainers uh, for the movement. Um, and one of my favorite programs that we get to run uh, is our Educational Legislative Fellowship Program. Uh, the program is relatively young compared to a lot of uh, other uh, DC fellowship uh, programs. Uh, we've been around for about four years uh, and have um, a current cohort of five fellows uh, and 10 alumni. Um, the fellowship program is for folks who are interested in the legislative process. We place fellows in a member of Congress's office where they serve as part of the legislative team. Um, fellows are generally early to mid-career professionals uh, with experience in policy and advocacy and organizing. Um, and we do require that they have little to no experience on the Hill. Uh, we know, you know, a lot of folks know the vicious cycle of needing experience on the Hill to get on the Hill. Um, and we wanna really take out that barrier. Um, and so our fellows serve for six months and then it can be renewed for another six months um, and are paid uh, $55,000 annually um, and get the same benefits that our staff get, such as um, uh, fully paid uh, health care um, and a 401k with uh, vacation days and sick days and, um, and all of those, uh, those benefits. Um, and we've had a lot of success with our, our uh, alumni. Most recent alums have gone on to become, uh, just some of them uh, have been legal counsel for Ed and Labor, uh, committee legislative directors and deputy chiefs uh, for progressive members of Congress. 
Uh, some are working for the administration. Um, uh, another one is a council for, for the uh, House Committee. Um, and those who choose to leave the Hill have become local and state leaders, such as you know, the Director of Health Equity, uh, Policy and Government Affairs for major cities, um, and others uh, work um, in the advocacy and policy uh, space within the progressive ecosystem. Um, and so we just opened our current application process for the upcoming cohort. Um, and invite you to apply if you're interested. Uh, the deadline to apply is September 2nd, um, and the fellowship will start uh, in mid-January. Um, and fellows, uh, when, when applying or applicants when applying, pick a specific issue area that, um, that they have uh, expertise in. Um, it, you know, some fellows are doing democracy fellowships, uh, foreign policy, healthcare, education, labor, and climate. Um, and so happy to answer more questions, but uh, our website has a lot of the different requirements um, for the program, a little bit more detail on the benefits of the program and, and our program offerings. Um, and so that's a little bit about uh, our program. Um, and I will throw my email in the chat and folks feel, uh, feel free to you know, reach out to me if you have any questions um, about our fellowship. Vamala, thank you so much. And we're so happy to have the CPCC uh, represent this year for the first time on this uh, panel. And it, it will provide hopefully great opportunity for many in, uh, potential interns to apply. All right, next up, we're gonna move on to Omar El Sayed, who is the program manager of the Islamic Scholarship Fund. Brother Omar, Salam alaikum, brother. The floor is yours. Alaikum uh, thank you so much for having me, Jihad. It's honestly, it is a privilege, and I want to sincerely thank you for providing the space for us to reach out to folks who are interested uh, in the work that we do. For those of you who uh, don't know, my name is Omar Alceda, as Jihad uh, mentioned. I'm the program manager for ISF. ISF is an organization that uh, increases American Muslim representation in media and policy uh, to improve the public perception, improve politics surrounding the Muslim community uh, here in the U.S., and we believe that our interests of the community can only be protected if we are a part of the policymaking process. So we're, we're not only involved in uh, policy, we're also involved in the media. So we have programs that support journalists. We also have programs that uh, support filmmakers. We have programs that support uh, people in, involved in law. So I know a lot of uh, you folks may be pre-law. So uh, I would encourage you to visit our website and learn a little bit more about the broad array of programs, there's no way on earth I could cover them uh, in today's presentation, uh, especially since I'm going to be focusing more on uh, our policy vertical and the programs that we offer. So uh, much like others have mentioned, it's pretty apparent for those that have spent some time on the Hill or, or are working in D.C. that it's not always the most diverse space, uh, especially for the Muslim community. Uh, there's just not a lot of representation. And we're aware of what that uh, impact or what impact that has had uh, on our community and on policy surrounding our community. So we started this program, uh, we started multiple programs, uh, internship and fellowship programs to kind of create this gateway or this network for people to uh, get their foot into uh, working on the Hill and working in DC. Uh, so we provide a internship program. Uh, this uh, program for the first time this year is now available as a fall internship, spring and summer. We have been doing it for quite some time as a summer only internship, uh, but now we're offering both spring and fall internships for the first time. And our fall internship application is actually open right now. Uh, you can see our application on the website. So if you'd like to get started uh, and take a look at the website, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, as far as the benefits of the internship, it does change depending on fall, spring and summer. I'm not gonna be able to get into the details, but in general, I'll speak uh, because right now the fall internship application is open. Uh, we provide a, if you need housing, uh, some people are, some folks are already living in DC, but if you need housing, uh, we provide a 3,200 uh, monthly stipend that is, that's supposed to cover both the cost of living and also the cost of housing for you. While you're in DC, we obviously provide placement. Uh, we have relationships with some congressional offices that are, uh, in favor of, I think, working with the Muslim community. And so we want to put you two together and kind of get you some experience so that ultimately you can have a career, as others have mentioned, working on the Hill. That's kind of our, how we measure our impact, what the ultimate goal for ISF 
is that we want more folks who are uh, working and hopefully this internship or this eventually when we talk about the fellowship will serve as a stepping stone for you to get there. Uh, in addition to the placement of the stipends, there's also plenty of uh, kind of skills-based benefits. We provide an orientation, so you're not in the deep end as soon as you arrive on the hill and you know what you're doing and we want to make sure that our interns have all the support that they need. So that, go that covers from orientation to even mentorship during the internship. Uh, we provide, uh, depending on, again, spring, summer, fall, sometimes it's every two weeks, sometimes it's every week, provide professional network, uh, networking opportunities, professional development opportunities, and professional mentorship opportunities. And lastly, after the program is over, we do provide uh, access to what we call the ISF family, the Islamic Scholarship Funds family. Uh, it's a network of now 500 alumni who are across those four fields that I mentioned earlier, media, policy, film, and the fil uh, field of law, uh, people who are working to make a difference for those very important fields uh, for the Muslim community. So a little bit about dates for the internship and we'll move to the fellowship. Our fall internship application is actually open right now. It will be in, uh, due in July, in the middle of July. And then we will then have our spring internship application that will be opening up in the fall and will be due in October. And then lastly, our summer internship application will be opening probably sometime in November and will be due uh, in January. I want to really quickly move to eligibility before I move on. Uh, in order, and I heard others speaking earlier about what identifies you as a member of the community. Uh, what we put on our website, and I think we're pretty open-ended. We're not going to be, uh, there's no way to verify, oh, are you actually a, a American Muslim? So if you, if you yourself identify as a member of the Muslim community, I think that's fair enough. Uh, we do ask that you major in a ISF supported major. So uh, we want to make sure that folks are, again, they're not using this as just something for fun in the summer, but instead as a stepping stone to get them into a career working in the field of their choice that kind of aligns with ISF's mission. So we have a list of supported majors on our website. And you have to be enrolled in an accredited university. You have to be a student currently or just graduated for the internship, maintaining a minimum 3.0 GPA. And lastly, a US citizen, permanent resident of the US or DACA recipient. And I wish we could include it to more and, and I'm working on it. Okay, for the uh, fellowship, the fellowship is, as other have mentioned, it's a little bit more rigorous, a little bit more skill intensive. Uh, many of our fellows work directly for an office's legislative director, and they kind of get to work on a little bit more uh, legislative based work. Uh, we just so we've we've offered one fellowship to folks uh, for the past few years that we've had that program. This year we are offering two fellowships and I believe in the future we're opening to we're open to offering more than two fellowships. So if you are interested in a serious career on the Hill, I would uh, encourage you to consider applying for this. It's now a nine month program where we offer a annual stipend of 40,000 across those nine months. We, we do provide round trip airfare to DC. We offer health insurance reimbursement of up to 200 a month. Obviously we get you placed in an office and all of the other uh, professional based, I'm going to save your time, all the other professional based uh, opportunities and benefits, just like the internship, are provided to you if you're a fellow. Again, including that access to the ISF family and joining that network of change makers looking to make a difference for our community. Uh, as far as dates, the, uh, the fellowship ac application is actually aligned at the same time as the summer internship application. So the, uh, the application will go live sometime in November and will be uh, due sometime in January. So all of that information should be available on our website. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Do wish I could get a little bit more into the details, but I wanna respect everyone's time. And again, I wanna thank uh, Jihad and Islamic Relief for having us, so thank you. Thank you, Brother Omar. Greatly appreciate you sharing ISF's uh, opportunities. And so we are coming to our last speaker, uh, but please, again, keep those questions coming in uh, into the Q&A uh, function. And as Greta is uh, looking at them, and we'll get those uh, 
after our last speaker for those uh, last 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. And also just to be aware, we're also, there's several other organizations in DC that provide internships and fellowships that are not on this uh, webinar. We, we can't put 10 people on, it'll be too long, but we'll share more information and links about other programs at the end when I do just some overview. And we'll also share an update on our next fellowship, our, our next webinar next week. Uh, we'll put the link in. That's for those who actually want to hear from congressional staff in various positions in Senate and House offices uh, about the work that they do. So that's a great supplemental or complimentary webinar next Thursday uh, that we'll share with that. And that'll be for when we finish off with informational share. But our last speaker um, from the Washington, the Women's Center, the Women's Congressional Policy Institute. I always got to get that right. WCPI is, uh, is Cynthia Ramos. Cynthia is actually a current, is currently this policy director at the Women's Congressional Policy Institute. And prior to joining WCPI, she worked on Capitol Hill serving in the United States Senate as a senior legislative staff working on bipartisan issues. Cynthia, we're happy to have you on. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Just gonna quickly share my screen. All right, again, thank you. Uh, my name is Cynthia and I'm policy director at the Women's Congressional Policy Institute. And before I begin, I wanted to um, share a little bit about our, who we are as an organization and our mission. So the Women's Congressional Policy Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy organization whose mission is to bring together a community of bipartisan women policymakers and trusted partners to advance issues of importance to women, develop the next generation of women leaders, and foster a more representative democracy. We work in very close cooperation with the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues, or the Women's Caucus for short, and currently the leadership of the Women's Caucus. Uh, we have Congressman Madeline Dean and Jennifer gonzalez Colon as co-chairs, and the vice chairs are Congresswoman Lucy McBath and Kat Kamak. And I just wanted to quickly go over our internship program. And we have two paid internships at WCPI. Um, our first is um, our policy intern. As a policy intern, you would be responsible for assisting our staff with some of our key programs like our congressional policy briefings and publishing our weekly legislative update, which is a report that compiles all the bills that were introduced in the House and Senate in the previous week that impact women and girls and contains the congressional schedule for the upcoming week regarding hearings and markups and floor votes that are relevant to women. And I encourage you, everyone to visit our website for more information where you'll also find a very helpful video explaining the internship and hear from some of our past interns about their experiences at WCPI. Next, we have a communications and development internship and our comms and development intern plays a key role in helping to expand our outreach and fundraising initiatives. We're looking for interns who have their finger on the pulse of social media and digital outreach and have a genuine interest in development and fundraising work. Both internships are open to current undergraduate students or if it's been less than six months since you've graduated from college. Next, I'll briefly talk about our congressional fellowships on women in public policy. The paid fellowships are extended each year to a select number of graduate students either pursuing or who have recently completed a master's doctorate or professional degree with a proven commitment to equity for women. Our fellowship is unique in that it's the only graduate fellowship uh, on Capitol Hill focused on women. And the fellowship is designed to train potential leaders in public policy to examine issues from the perspective, experiences and needs of women. So if you're chosen for the fellowship, you would gain practical policymaking experience and graduate credit um, working in a congressional office 40 hours a week from January through July as a legislative assistant. Our fellows receive $3,400 per month and are eligible to receive up to $1,000 to cover health insurance costs. The application for the 2023 fellowship is now closed, but please pay, check back next April to apply for the 2024 fellowship. If you'd like to learn more about the fellowship program, um, you're in luck because we just held a fellowship webinar last month um, of which the recording of the webinar is available on our website. And here are some key dates for applying to our internship and fellowship programs. And lastly, in closing, I just wanted to reiterate um, that the purpose and goal of WCPI's internship and fellowship programs is to build and expand the pipeline of young women leaders in public policy 
And we believe there is a need for students from underrepresented groups to come and take their seat at the policymaking table, so to speak. So we believe this matters greatly to uh, creating an effective and representative democracy for positive change. Um, and thank you. And I'll look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Cynthia. Greatly appreciate that information about WCPI's programs. And again, for all you uh, tuning in, students, interns, uh, emerging professionals, I hope this has been really you know, informative for you. Uh, now we're gonna move into uh, our Q&A. Uh, there's some questions already in line. Uh, we're gonna take about 15, 20 minutes uh, uh, for all six of our panelists uh, to respond to you. And then as I said, it will, then we'll close out myself and Greta will share some information about other uh, programs and share the links uh, uh, for various other organizations that may be of interest to you that are based upon also various identity or particular policy interests. And then we'll also share the link to next week's uh, 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 in a webinar that we have, Capitol Hill's Careers. And also there, again, there was a question concerning about this program. Again, this is being recorded. It will be available on Islamic Relief USA's uh, YouTube page, uh, definitely by tomorrow morning. So again, please share this. If uh, you go back to reference it and share it with your friends. All right, I'm going to take the privilege as moderator. I'm going to start for the question, uh, and it may be more directed to the Tri Caucus or those who've had at least a much longer experience with hosting uh, fellows, particularly those who are, you know, graduate students, uh, had professional careers, and who've had the long-term placements. Um, maybe Dennis, or you know, and and it, it, it's maybe we'll see CHCI and CBCF. Um, is there, what has been, is there a particular percentage or what has been the success rate of saying those who are in fellowships in an office or a congressional committee where those positions actually end up turning into permanent positions? And I just remember that was always for many fellows that I engaged when I worked in Congress. I remember some of them, these positions transition, not all, but is if that is an objective or hope for many of the applicants who want to get in those positions, you know, how successful uh, is that actually, or how often does that materialize? And that's open up to particularly for this, all of you who, uh, provide fellowship programs? Um, for CHCI, what I would say, probably in the last few years, more than half of our fellows have gone on to go work uh, directly on Capitol Hill or stayed in Washington as a whole. Since we do have run the gamut of different kinds of fellows, some of our fellows go back to grad school, some of our fellows go on and do other things or go home. Uh, like they realize some folks that they don't want to do work in DC, but they want to do work at home. So they still go into nonprofit public service work, but they do it back in their home states. But I would say roughly about half have those who have wanted to stay in DC, a majority like we'll find we'll find time. And we also start halfway through their program, January, February-ish, saying like, okay, you want a job. This is the things that you're going to need to do in order to get a job here at DC and stay here. So it's it's finding a job with support of the institution um, where it's different from you trying to find a job on your own. Nicholas uh, or, or Cynthia, anyone else response for your respective fellows? Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, um, so we have a pretty high retention rate on Capitol Hill, about anywhere from half to three quarters every cohort. Um, our most recent cohort that finished um, at the end of May, of the nine, seven of them stayed on Capitol Hill. Um, it's more or less kind of a situation of if they want to stay on Capitol Hill, they'll find a job whether in their current placement office or in a different office. Um, and, you know, it, it, it also depends very much on like, uh, you know, what the kind of politics are on the on the hill and who holds majority. But um, typically, if they want to stay, we get between half to two thirds staying on the hill. Yeah, um, oops, I'm sorry. It's similar um, at WCPI as well. Um, we have usually about three or four fellows each year. And we have many who have now become permanent staff in their offices um, if they choose to stay, both in the House and the Senate. Debra? Yeah, um, yeah, it depends on definitely if they still want to continue working on the Hill after their fellowships. But we do have a high percentage of um, a lot of the um, Black congressional <laughs> members or um, uh, Black interns or the Hill or Black individuals on the Hill do come from the CBCF uh, in regards of their um, internship or their fellowship. So it honestly just depends on their, um, on, on them, but for the most part, um, they, yeah, they definitely get jobs on the Hill afterwards. All right, thank you for all sharing that. Again, 
These are major pipelines. Yeah. Increasing diversity on Capitol Hill and various offices. All right, so we have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, uh, Greta, do you want to share uh, the first one? Yes, um, this is for Omar at ISS. Um, who is eligible for the fellowship in terms of career experience? A great question. And I noticed that was asked by uh, Cynthia, who was actually a current summer intern. So it's actually really, I, I appreciate the, the shout out, I guess, but uh, I would say someone that is eligible first off is you, Cynthia, because I think now that you're uh, an intern and you have some experience on the Hill, that would put you in a prime spot. Uh, and I've noticed that from other, we were, others were talking about their fellowship experiences earlier and their placement rates. One thing I've noticed among the interns, it's kind of like a natural flow for interns to, they get they kind of get their feet wet with an internship and if they're serious, they can then apply for a fellowship and not just for ISF's fellowship, but I, you know, for example, ISF fellows, or excuse me, interns have, you know, there's one person that comes to mind, let's say that applied for a fellowship program with ISF and other uh, organizations that are here today, didn't receive it, completed an internship, and then was able to complete a fellowship uh, and move forward and kind of advance her career. So, uh, but to answer your question specifically, we are looking for people who have a little bit more professional experience, uh, especially full-time experience. People who have graduated uh, multiple years of professional experience are preferred, uh, but some exceptions have been made in the past, depending on uh, sometimes there's a candidate that's just an all-star and they really demonstrated that they're capable in one way or, or another. So I do hope that that answers your question, Cynthia. Actually, I think there was one other question directed at Omar. Might as well uh, build that one also. Greta? Yes. Um, the next question is, what is a natural follow-up to finishing a fellowship on the Hill? And what do most people end up doing as far as job titles? Yeah, I think it, it, it kind of depends on uh, that fellow's individual interest. Uh, but in general, what ISF is imagining is that someone will end up in either an LC or LA role. So working as a legislative assistant or consultant, working underneath it. So pretty much the exact same role that they're uh, working in as a fellow, hopefully that they can, now that they have some close to a year of experience under their belt doing that, they can find a, a position either with the office that they were uh, doing a fellowship with. Oftentimes that's not possible because there's just no space. And so they've had plenty, ideally they've had plenty of time to network with other offices and uh, find a, a position elsewhere, so. All right, thank you, Omar. All right, you keep those questions rolling in. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, put share another one. Um, so for both, for all the organizations that have both an internship program, which is often seems most focused toward undergraduates, and then those, and also have fellowship programs that are for uh, people with seasoned careers or a good amount of professional experience and or graduate studies. Can someone apply eventually for both? Say they do the internship undergrad, then they graduate, you know, maybe work for three or four years or even go to grad school and come back, then apply, try to apply for the fellowship. Is that is that uh, normal um, with the attempt to try to provide as many opportunities for different people in your community? Is that more of a knock? Um, someone try to get double dip per se? Uh, what's some input on that or insight on the opportunity or the opportunity or you know, do people try to apply for both in a sequence of five to six years? I, I can speak for our program. I think we we like to, we actually have a name for it. We call it a cycle of support. So it's not something that only exists in the policy vertical, but for our film programs and uh, law programs as well, is that we do want to encourage people, okay, you apply for a policy scholarship. And then after, so while you're in school, you're being supported by ISF. And then, you know, you decide that you a career in DC is for you. So you think about the internship, you go for it. And ultimately, if the, the fellowship is in the cards for you, I think we, we appreciate that. And I think that makes us feel like um, it kind of shows that our work is making a difference and pushing you into uh, the career that ISF is, because that's ISF's mission, right? Is that we want folks to be working in the field. A lot of times people, especially in the Middle Eastern community, political science is actually a very popular uh, major, you know, for I think pretty obvious reasons considering America's foreign policy. So they'll study political science, but a lot of times it's very difficult for them to actually land a meaningful career. That's where this program comes in. So I, I hope that makes sense. And I, I do want to hear from others as well. 
Sure. Uh, maybe some from the Tri Caucus is being already a former intern or, or alumni intern. Is that a, uh, a, a extra star on your resume applying, or is it not, not really doesn't impact if they apply later on for the fellowship? Yeah, I know for the um, CBCF, if you are if you are an intern, you can apply for our fellowship. Um, not the op not the other way around, but if you were a previous intern, you can apply for our fellowship if you meet the requirements. Um, if you have your graduate degree. So that does, it's an added perk um, because you you know how our system runs and operates internally. So yes, I hope that answers the question. Um, for CHCI, you can apply. However, I will say that I, as a person, generally discourage it because it's kind of like you're going to the same well. Like, like if you're going to take opportunities, I would say diversify your network because you're basically going to meet some of the same people. You're going to do some of the same programming all over again. So I would say go do one of the, the progressive caucus, go do whatever, go do with somebody else's work because you're going to get exposure to a whole new group of folks that will expand your network. But that's just a me thing. That's not an official CHCI thing. You can definitely apply, but I think um, that would be kind of uh, just some advice for folks if they're thinking about um, doing another type of program similarly in DC. Yeah, on, on the APAC end, we certainly don't. Uh, like it's, you know, you're allowed to. Um, historically, we haven't had particularly large internship or fellowship cohorts compared to the rest of the tri caucus. It's really grown exponentially since 2019, 2020. Um, so there's not really like a historical standard for interns becoming fellows, but uh, it's not something we encourage or discourage. It doesn't disqualify you by being an APAC intern. Um, but yeah, I, we, we do have a similar mindset to Dennis where, um, you know, I think there's a lot of really good opportunities and intersectional opportunities in DC that, that um, you know, upcoming young professionals can definitely take advantage of outside of APAX. Everyone, thank you for sharing that information concerning, you know, that pipeline uh, between both your programs. Um, I think we, there's another question uh, from Cynthia. Greta, if you want to share that. Yes. Um, does anyone have any tips on how to know when an office has an opening? I notice most of these openings are hired internally. Now, I'll say this quickly. This is a core question that will be raised next week when we have our webinar with congressional staff about how to land a job in Congress, whether you're in a fellowship program or not. Uh, so, but I, if, if, if anyone wants to fill this question, please. Well, maybe hey, let's, let's, yeah, that is a plug for join, tune in next Thursday at 11 a.m. Uh, to hear from congressional staff to tell you how they got that job. Yes, what is, how, what's the secret to getting landed on Capitol Hill? We're going to share that link to that, um, to that event at the end of the program. And also, if you are, if you registered for this webinar, uh, we will also be sending you in your email the flyer and the link for that with right after this program. So you'll get that and share that. Um, I have a question, and this is kind of, again, for uh, the fellowship program, but also helps for aspirational for the undergrads. What are maybe some of the, for those who do have graduate degrees, what are some of the various graduate level degrees, whether they be master or PhD level that you see that are people bringing? And because and I just know, I, I think a lot of people always assume, well, if I'm working in Congress, I have to have a law degree. I have to get a JD. You know, Congress, you know, engineering, engineer. Doctor, medical degree. Congress, laws, law degree. Is that the only degree you need or what are the varieties that you've seen come through the years with people with their higher education? Please share. Um, well, for CCI, I know we have different kinds of graduate degrees, um, fellowships, because we do have some for STEM because STEM is actually a needed piece. So when you go into the science and technology committee or when you're talking about engineering, having a background, the technical background is helpful um, when talking about certain policies. Um, also the same thing for our program. We also have, we've had folks with an MBA or business degree um, or economics because when you're going into appropriations or going to some kind of committee, it's important to have that kind of background. Um, so it's not just folks with a political science degree. We run the gamut of people in uh, food science and technology because we've had nutrition fellows. Um, 
that focus on um, food insecurity, but they also have that technical background. Um, so I would say for folks in all majors, it's really important to kind of think about it or be open to the policy conversation. Because once again, if you don't choose to go into policy, you still have now a policy background when you go back into your field that a lot of the folks in your field do not have. Yeah, same for the CBCS fellowship. It just, um, your program doesn't have, you don't have to have an education, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, policy background. Um, it just more so has to align with your expert, expertise and your liking. So we do have um, interns that, that are not in a political space, but they, like you said, food science or um, working in more of like a STEM background and things of that nature. So yeah, you don't have to have that. We, we actually encourage interns, I mean, sorry, fellows who have like a STEM background for different um, type of fellowships that we have. So if you go to our website, you can see the variety of um, fellows that we cur currently have and what their expertise are in and what their backgrounds are aligned in. Um, so our fellowship is, a, a, is well, our, all of our programs are more, it's not, it's just not focused on just you having to have an uh, education, um, sorry, not education, <laughs> a, um, a policy background. You can have a background in uh, communications, journalism, um, things of that nature. Maybe one more share. Before I would say, say, go ahead, Cynthia, please. Um, we are looking for candidates who have a demonstrated interest in equity for women. Um, they can be from all types of educational backgrounds. We're not looking for a particular major interest area. But um, as I mentioned before, um, we are looking for potential leaders in public policy that are going to examine issues from the perspective and experiences and needs of women. Again, thank you for sharing all that. Again, we'll, you'll get more details for those who join next week when you actually hear from the five or six congressional staff that we have. No doubt one will have a JD, but there will be people with many other degree, degrees. But we heard you know, communication, journalism, public policy, STEM, educational policy. Uh, so there's, you know, I, I myself had a, have a public policy, public affairs degree focused on domestic policy. Um, so it doesn't just have to be a law degree. All right. So I think we're going to wrap up now uh, for the Q&A, and, and, and I just want to take this time to thank all our friends from the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies, the, the Women's, uh, Center, uh, Women's Congressional Policy Institute, the Islamic Scholarship Fund, and the Congressional Policy Progressive Caucus Center. Uh, for joining us this year. I, uh, we thank you for taking time sharing the wonderful information. I'm glad we've been able to record this one and it'll be available tomorrow for YouTube for all of you, our attendees, uh, to, to reference back to. Please again, utilize the information that we've provided in the chat, the direct context if you have further questions. Um, so I, again, wanna thank all of you for joining in and we're gonna take these last five minutes and me and Greta are gonna share a few more points of information uh, for some other organizations so again, these six organizations are great, but there's other programs that we didn't have on this, on this webinar, but we wanna raise uh, your awareness. And if you're someone who's interested, say particularly in the issue of maybe poverty, hunger and food security, uh, the Congressional Hunger Center, uh, which is a congressional mandated created institute here in Washington, DC, uh, Greta is putting the link in there. It's a wonderful internship and fellowship program. Um, uh, if you're interested in both, check that out. I think that's where we've consistently had a lot of great interns come onto our program and my interns in, in, engage with, but there's a lot of great professional networking out of the Congressional Hunger Center if you're interested in food security hunger and, and poverty in general in Washington, D.C. Another great organization that provides fellowships and internships is also the Victory Fund uh, that focuses on uh, the empowerment and the rights for the LGBTQ community uh, that we've provided in uh, on, on to the link. So the Victory Fund. And, and, and last but not least, there is also another organization um, that particularly for the Muslim American community, along with Islamic Scholarship Fund, uh, but there is the Muslim Public Affairs uh, CD, CFLD, the Congressional uh, Leadership Development Found, Fund, Fund, CLDF, yes. CLDP, Congressional Leadership Development Program. Program. Yes, uh, their program, uh, but they're, they're specifically their program is just for the summer compared to ISF that provides internships and fellowships throughout the year. Uh, Impact's program is specifically just for the summer. Um, and so we hope that, you know, again, the Congressional Hunger Center, that's a particular policy interest of yours, the, the Victory Fund and the Impact CLDP program 
are some of the also great other programs that we highly recommend that you, you know, investigate if that's in, of interest to you or again, share with your friends, your fellow college students. If you're going to be here next summer, if you're coming in here to D in DC, bring a friend or two along, help them find out about how they can also get some travel fare, some free housing and a, a, a stipend that helps them you know, along with you, hang out with your friends and get part of this bigger network of all these great interns on Capitol Hill. You're an ambassador now of all this information. Please share that with them. And so then last, I, I did mention we have one more uh, webinar for this series next week, which is a good compliment to this one is, so when you are interning, if you want to think long-term about having a career on Capitol Hill, and you think about, well, what is, well, what are you doing as, on Capitol as a staffer? What are the skill sets that you need, which these internships and fellowships can help you develop? Um, you know, and then how do you land that job if you're not per se in a, fellow, a, a graduate program? There's other ways and routes onto capital. We're going to have a wonderful webinar next year, uh, next week uh, that Greta just put in the uh, the link. Just cut and paste that um, the email that 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 that, uh, that address. They'll take you to the registration page for our Capitol Hill careers on Thursday, July 7th at 11 a.m. Um, again, we will be sending out the flyer and link. If you registered for the Zoom for this program, we'll be sending that out immediately after this program. Please share that far and wide with your interns, college students, and young professional careers. Uh, I think both these, in, both these programs are uh, you know, great resources. I will say this, this program, with all our great uh, partners from you know ISF and, and and CSCI and so forth, this is recorded and it's going to be available on our YouTube page tomorrow. Our program, though, with our congressional staff members, who will talk about their various positions to help you understand what are the positions that you you can do in a congressional office, a committee, or a district office. Uh, who should you be working with when you're doing your internship to learn about what they do? We want to empower those speakers to speak truthfully about their experiences, the positives and the benefits, the, uh, the things they love about it, or some of the, the challenges, uh, what are some of the roadblocks on issues of diversity and so forth. We want them to freely speak. So that program is not going to be recorded. Uh, it's going to be off the record. So you got to get on that one. Register if you want to hear, get that, that information. Uh, so next week, you'll get the flyer. So we look forward to seeing you also next week. Hope this has been beneficial to all of you across this country. Um, and if you have questions, um, you do have the email address on the flyer that you receive. You can always follow up with Greta um, and we'll get back to you if you have questions specifically to Islamic Relief. We do ourselves have internships. We don't have a fellowship or internship program on Capitol Hill, but our interns do lobby and advocate to members of Congress. Um, so always want to plug that, the great public policy and lobbying uh, internship here at, at Islamic Relief USA at our national office in Washington, D.C. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us this morning, and hopefully we look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, everyone, again, share this information, share the links. You come next summer and bring some friends. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great rest of the week.